Hi class, uh, welcome to your lecture on Christian philosophy, theology, um, late antiquity, and the medieval period. The subject of the rise of Christianity and its venerable intellectual traditions is a really complicated one that has been uh, written about and discussed extensively. There are innumerable courses on the rise of Christianity in pagan antiquity. If you haven't yet, this might also be a good time to watch the Agora film, which uh, situates these developments in the 3rd, 4th century AD in the context of the Egyptian city of Alexandria. To really do a good job here, we, we would have to do a lot of background work, uh, like in a world religion class, and become more familiar with the history of Judaism since 1500 BCE as well as its developments through the kingdoms of Israel and Judea, followed by the Babylonian and Assyrian exiles and captivities, and the writing down of the Hebrew Bible around 600 to 400 BCE. And then we would have to sort of watch the geopolitical developments going on in the Middle East, things like the Persian and then the Hellenistic occupation, followed by the Roman occupation. Suffice to say, there are numerous excellent courses and YouTubes on all these topics. For our purposes in a philosophy class, probably the key thing to underline is that the philosophical conception of God that we derive from the Old Testament or the Torah is very different uh, than the concept of the divine and nature that we get from Greek philosophy. In Genesis 1, this is, uh, God literally creates nature out of nothing, a creation ex nihilo. And this idea of a supreme uh, being who is the literal creator of nature and the establisher of its laws, as well as the maker of human beings in its image, is really a very different kind of philosophical world picture than the ones we've studied so far by way of Greek pagan philosophy, in which nature is seen to be eternal and without a beginning. So the philosophy of history and the philosophical religion you can develop on the basis of the Old Testament really derives from a quite different world than the world of, say, the pre-Socratic, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, or the Hellenistic schools which followed. And then of course, during the Roman occupation, you have the birth, life, mission, and death of the historical Jesus. And then the gradual spread of Christianity as a new religion taught to the Gentiles, not just to the Jews, throughout the first to fourth centuries CE. In fact, the authors of the New Testament, especially St. John and Paul, appear to have been very deeply educated in Greco-Roman philosophy and religion. They are also writing in Koine Greek, that is common Greek, which is the lingua franca of the realm of Rome. One can find a lot of really deep philosophy, especially uh, ethical philosophy, but also um, a fair amount of metaphysics uh, in the New Testament. St. John takes the Greek term logos, which by now has been richly developed in Greek philosophy from Heraclitus through Plato and in the Stoics and reconceptualizes the Logos as the Word of God and also as the Incarnation of Christ. Unlike in some of the other Gospel writers in St. John, you see the seeds developing of a bona fide Christian theology or philosophical view of the cosmos, and these seeds are grown to a certain degree of maturity in the epistles of St. Paul, St. Paul never having been an actual disciple of Christ but being converted by a vision of Christ or a visitation on the road to Damascus and subsequently playing a major role in the formation of early Christian communities across the Mediterranean. Despite a generally negative view of women and a number of troubling political passages in St. Paul, Paul was a brilliant writer who is probably more responsible than anyone else, A, for the spread of Christianity among the Gentiles, and B, for the form that Christian philosophy and theology would take after Paul. And there are many excellent studies of St. Paul in the history of philosophy and the history of the philosophy of religion. In fact, Paul enjoyed something of a renaissance of interest in Heinrich Reitzenstein, in Martin Heidegger, in Jakob Tawas, in Slavov Žižek, in Georgiou Agamben, etc., etc. After the lives of the Gospel writers and the missionizing of St. Paul, enormously diverse Jesus literature sprung up throughout the Mediterranean. There was not a lot of consensus as to how early Christianity was to be self-understood other than the writings of Paul. So in many places, Christianity interacted with other local and pan-Hellenic or pan-Roman cosmopolitan religions, as well as with its Judaic roots. This produced a plethora of literatures, most of which have been lost, such as the writings of the Gnostics, 
and various sects and forms of Christianity that were an amalgamation or blending with other religious and philosophical ideas. The quest for a uniform self-definition of what the Christian religion really is and is all about begins in the second century CE with the Christian apologists, develops through early church fathers like Origen and Dionysius the Areopagite, becoming an extensive uh, point of discussion among the various bishops throughout the increasingly Christianized Roman Empire. And it is in this cultural context against the background of three centuries of uh, scholarly uh, debate and religious debate about the nature of Christianity that we can situate both the life of Augustine as well as the canonization of uh, the core Christian texts. The life of Augustine is situated right in the middle of this enormous transformation, basically the end of pagan or Greco-Roman antiquity and the beginning of Judeo-Christian antiquity. Now I know a fair bit about Augustine, but I'm by no means an Augustine scholar. I've only really read excerpts from the City of God and half of the Confessions, but many years ago. My main knowledge about Augustine comes through the philosophical uh, interpretive traditions that surround Augustine within my own specialized field of continental philosophy and the continental philosophy of religion. And so I first got interested in Augustine when I read early lectures by Martin Heidegger. This is the, his 1920 lectures, The Phenomenology of Religious Life, in which a previously Catholic, recently converted to Protestantism, Heidegger, attempts to reckon with Martin Luther's legacies and theological readings of the New Testament and uh, what Heidegger calls the experience of primordial Christian life. In this context, Heidegger uh, develops really interesting readings of St. Paul, some of the early church uh, fathers, as well as St. Augustine. And then Heidegger's uh, student and lover, actually, uh, Hannah Arendt, wrote her doctoral dissertation on love and St. Augustine. I found this to be a very fascinating book, or wasn't very well received at the time in St. Augustine studies, coming as it was from a more philosophical uh, formation. That all being said, in this lecture, I'll do my best to tell you what I find um, very interesting. So Augustine was born in North Africa, and he's a figure who has one foot in the pagan world and one foot in the Christian world uh, throughout his early life until his early 30s around. His mother always prayed for his immortal salvation and tried to push him in the direction of Christian conversion, but his father uh, was a Roman magistrate working in North Africa and gave him a more traditional, if narrow, pagan education, only to eventually convert to Christianity on his deathbed. Uh, Augustine is the inventor of the literary genre we know as autobiography, and his Confessions is the first great example of an autobiographical uh, text in the Western tradition. In it, we learn a lot about Augustine's early life, involvement in various religious sects at the time, such as Manichaeanism, his views on subject matters he was teaching as a professor of rhetoric, and also through Cicero and then later St. Ambrosia, his gradual initiation into Greek philosophy, eventually leading through the admixture of Neoplatonism to Augustine's illustrious career within the expanding church and on his own account by the grace of God, his working out of the foundations of Christian philosophy, which would be effective and the most determinative and influential uh, synopsis or crystallization of the Christian worldview for over a thousand years. It's surprising when we read Augustine uh, just how readable and enjoyable it is and how modern Augustine's voice sounds at times. At the time he was writing his great work, The City of God, and various other fundamental treatises for the history of Christian theology, such as On Free Will or On the Trinity, there is a wondrously palpable sense that Augustine has more or less integrated the whole history of Greco-Roman philosophy as well as the history of religious ideas up into his day and that he is breaking new ground in terms of philosophical analysis and concepts more or less at every turn. Augustine is also the inventor of the Christian doctrine of original sin as a specific way of reading the Judaic myth of the Garden of Eden in Genesis. The cardinal sin resulting in Adam and Eve's expulsion from the garden is pride or superbia. This is going to differ from St. Aquinas' view that it is greed or gluttony. Important to underline here is that Augustine's idea of original sin that we all inherit since the fall from grace in the garden is not a Jewish but a Christian idea here. You don't find this idea in the history of Jewish theology. 
And in order to explain pride or superbia, Augustine in his Confessions gives a vivid account of his youthful transgressions. This is the famous tale of the pear tree, where a group of adolescents shook an enormous amount of pears out of a tree and stole them all only to give them to pigs to eat. Augustine comments that here he commits sin just for the sake of transgression, that is for the sake of his expression of freedom, and in a way as an imitation of God, but one that was wholly misguided since God doing whatever he wants is fine for God, God being God, but to try to imitate this aspect of the divine, its divine freedom, is for the mortal human rooted in the sin of pride. For a time, Augustine flirted with academic skepticism, which we learned about last week. It was his attendance at Ambrosia's lectures, uh, which really sealed the deal of his final conversion to Christianity. Ambrosia utilized the philosophy of Neoplatonism in order to explain Christian doctrine and provided an allegorical interpretation of scripture which allowed Augustine to read scripture now more appreciatively and less literally. After an intense struggle with himself, he had been a fairly typical pagan in the pursuit of festive pleasures and desires, what he calls concupiscence. That is everything having to do with the desires of the flesh and the pleasures of this world. He eventually had an early midlife crisis, you could say, and felt like a house divided against himself and his own greatest contestant eventually hearing a quiet angelic voice telling him to open his Bible, at which his eyes fell on Paul Romans 13.13, 13, not in writing and drunkenness, but put ye your faith in Jesus Christ, not concupiscence. From this stunning moment of conversion, which is uh, expressed in much more detail in his confessions, Augustine goes on to live a virtuous life um, and becoming a leading Roman orator and then the Bishop of Hippo. So Augustine's uh, philosophy blends elements of Platonism and Christian religiosity, like Ambrosia. Most simply and schematically, he substitutes Judeo-Christian God for Plato's form of the good. Remember in Plato, the good is beyond being and even beyond the gods or God. And Plato had created a sort of great chain or hierarchy of degrees of being in terms of modeling on the forms as overseen by the form or the idea of the good. You can see how all these concepts admitted a ready adaptation uh, to the new Judeo-Christian philosophy. And as well, Augustine is one of the first major philosophers of time and history, accepting a linear view of history involving the creation of the world in seven days, like in Genesis, followed by God's creation of human beings, expulsion from the garden, into an imperfect world defined by pain, work, and sin. Moving on from there through all the events of biblical history and the various interventions of God in the linear uh, timeline of salvation or redemption, Augustine ultimately sees this life and the time of the world as mortal, ephemeral, and a test, wherein if human beings living in this world in the city of men can manage to save their immortal souls through faith and through works, what awaits them is the higher city or the city of God. Augustine's philosophy of time and history is very intricate and nuanced. Even contemporary philosophers of science or physics uh, usually engage with Augustine's views. He has very interesting and detailed analysis of the three dimensions of time in terms of memory, retention, anticipation, and the present moment. The most basic uh, point that Augustine presents in his philosophy of time is the distinction between this moment and eternity. Plato had distinguished between the static and the moving forms of eternity, and Aristotle had discussed time as the now point, but it is in St. Augustine that the idea of eternal timelessness of God is fully articulated for the first time. You find throughout the writings of Augustine various refutations of the Greek and Roman philosophical schools. Maybe the most significant or influential innovation in Augustine's thought as it integrates the rationalist tradition or the rational religions of Greek philosophy. In Augustine, instead of understanding being prior and privileged, like it was in Plato and most all Greek philosophy, as Melkirk says, for Augustine, faith must come first. Understanding may follow, though on some difficult topics such as the Trinity, understanding can only ever be partial. So the task of philosophy is to understand what we believe in for Augustine, not to believe what we can understand. This sort of commitment is for Augustine true wisdom. Happiness is getting what wisdom approves of. 
In the end, for Augustine, the Epicureans had set themselves up to indulge in that which they, by their own doctrine, believed shouldn't be indulged. Just as the Stoics be prideful about their status and resilience in a difficult world. Only a philosophy rooted in Christian faith can overcome these defects of character, according to Augustine. In other passages in a letter to Evodius, Augustine toys with the idea of identifying God and truth. His conclusion is that although truth and God are not strictly or logically identical, truth is the manifestation of God's goodness. Truth again is at center stage in Augustine's early version of the ontological argument. A little more on Augustine's philosophy of time. In time or temporality, all things are limited and flow into God or into nothingness. This is a bit like that scene in the Egyptian Book of the Dead or Papyrus of Ani, where the Ba or soul weighed against the feather of truth, either enters into the kingdom of the divine or simply disappears into nothingness. God is in every way beyond time, but what time is still mysterious. Augustine's most famous remarks here widely quoted in the philosophy of time are, I know well enough what it time is, provided that nobody asks me, but if I am asked what it is and try to explain, I am baffled. It won't be until Martin Heidegger's magnum opus Being in Time, written in 1927, that the philosophy of time takes its first fundamental steps beyond thinkers like Aristotle and Augustine. For Augustine, the present instant is the only time that we can properly experience, but the present itself is subdivided into the present of things past, what we remember, the present of things present, what we are directly aware of, and the present of things future. The present or now point always exists in the mind for Augustine as a created soul, and that mind or soul sees fragmentarily, but God sees everything at once. So eternity is defined by Augustine as a perpetual presentism. And it is the fact that the present is never all at once for us, which locks us into a linear history that will end in the city of God. An amusing passage occurs when he rails against the bad behavior of infants and children, claiming humorously that if babies are innocent, it is not for a lack of will to do harm, but a lack of strength. Anyone who has seen a mischievous glint in the child's eye can fully understand what Augustine is getting at here. We love to imagine that babies are the most innocent things, and yet it only takes a moment's observation to notice they can be quite evil. Although depending on our own religious backgrounds and commitments, we may be more or less well disposed to Augustine's doctrine of sin, regardless of those background commitments, Augustine's explanation of it as a form of disordered love is ethically uh, useful and valuable. Love is pure and good, and sin emerges as a perversion of love, the way in which love becomes willful and turns only towards its own private good. For Augustine, human nature is basically good and incorruptible, but we cannot make ourselves whole and must submit to this final humility. Charity and virtue are to be far preferred over cupidity and vice. And although love is absolute, action is relative, where the recognition of this paves the way to forgiveness. Those who love well and in an ordered way live in justice and sanctity, ordinate love being defined by Augustine as neither loving what should not be loved nor failing to love what should be loved, neither loving more what should be loved less, nor loving equally what should be loved less or more, nor not loving less or more what should be loved equally. It is the virtuous and charitable practice of ordinate love which grants the human soul the keys to the kingdom or the city of God. The transition from the city of man to the city of God is a transition from body to soul, from evil to goodness, from doubt to faith, and from blindness to understanding. Moving on from Augustine to medieval philosophy and theology in the Christian West, the videos for this week and our assigned readings are very clear on these slightly easier to understand areas of the philosophy of religion. Here, the student learning objective is to understand how the ontological argument for the existence of God develops um, in Anselm, to gain a basic foundation in the principles of Aquinas' Summa Theologica, especially his cosmological arguments for the existence of God. Since these are, have become fairly standardized in the philosophical tradition, and since the Crash Course videos cover them fairly well, I'll pass over them here, although the basic summation of both arguments uh, you can find in the slides.
Just a few words on Thomas Aquinas uh, before we finish the video for this week. The most important thing to know is that other than St. Augustine, Thomas Aquinas is the single most influential theologian in the history of the Catholic Church. Augustine's founding and development of the overall philosophical worldview of Christianity was more strongly rooted in Neoplatonism and other Hellenistic philosophies from late antiquity. Aquinas' major contribution is to utilize Aristotle and the enormously rich history of medieval theology and scholasticism in order to create the single most impressive and definitive demonstrative treatise of all the truths of the Christian faith that has ever been written, the Summa Theologica. Most famously, Aquinas distinguishes three levels of truths, those which are known by reason as well as natural experience, those which are known by reason and revelation, and truths which are only known by revelation, such as the Trinity and the Incarnation. In Aquinas, you could say, the fusion of Greek reason and Christian faith has become more or less complete. Faith is still leading the way in seeking understanding, but reason is a natural gift from God which allows us to understand both nature and the revelations of God. Reason only fails us on account of the direct influence of God through revelation, that is, so that there will still be mystery in the world and in Christian dogma. I wasn't raised a Christian and haven't uh, read the Summa Theologica extremely carefully myself, although my father was raised on it. The main point about Aquinas is that whether or not you identify with Christianity or even have any interest in it, there is no denying that the writings of Aquinas are among the richest philosophical writings on earth, and that many core Aquinian ideas have become not only irrefutable, vastly influential and interesting, not only inside Christianity but outside of it as well. I was in Toulouse, France last summer, and totally by chance stumbled into the church containing Aquinas' relics. As a saint of the Catholic Church, this is a pilgrimage site for many devoted Catholics. The church itself is interestingly modernized and full of beautifully designed plaques summing up the core teachings of the Aquinian legacy. Another core doctrine of Aquinas is his theory of natural law. Since all nature is created by God, God creates nature with morality built in. So it's not that nature is an immoral place while heaven is moral, but rather that ethical principles are built into every created thing. Human beings have a conscience and this conscious is rooted for Aquinas in the principle of synderesis. Synderesis being the inbuilt desire we have to do good, that is, to live in accordance with natural or moral law. In terms of metaphysics and epistemology, Aquinas' greatest contribution is his doctrine of analogy or proportion. Since everything is situated in the great chain of being in specific ways, and since everything has a relationship to God within the chain, Everything is analogical or proportional to everything else, everything that happens being an analogy or metaphor for the divine, either expressed in limited or in superlative degrees. Each word's meaning can be either univocal, referring only to one thing, equivocal, referring to many things, totalizing, referring to all things, or partial, referring to specific things. We have language and can use reason to understand God, because language and reason are the analogical systems which God endows in our minds. Because we can't know God directly and fully, the mystery of God is preserved by the fact that language and meaning functions analogically. Aquinas uses this doctrine to purify Latin in particular, acquiring in the process a Latin style extremely elegant, terse, and precise, pushing Latin as far as possible towards the literal truth of God. So I hope you've enjoyed your introduction to Christian philosophy and theology. I look forward to talking to you next week about the Islamic tradition.